It's hard not to love the dumbest automotive channel on YouTube and Tyler Hoover of Hoovy's Garage that delivers us such amazing content and stories on his own channel. But he's also been here and told some amazing VinWiki car stories. And today we've compiled his best ones into a single video for you to enjoy. And today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp. I actually discovered BetterHelp and started using it personally from one of Tyler's videos and they've come to be a sponsor of this channel. And we'd love for you to join the more than 4 million people that have met with a therapist through BetterHelp, and you can do that by saving 10% on your first month of therapy at betterhelp.com slash VinWiki. So check them out now, click the link in the description below. It is one of the easiest ways to get in touch with a therapist, start meeting with one, change to a new therapist if it's not exactly what you're looking for. I know this time of year, a lot of us are trying to set new goals, New Year's resolutions, keep with our New Year's resolutions, and everything that goes with that. And there's a lot of mental health issues that can stand in the way of us achieving our goals. Whether it's depression, anxiety, or paranoia, or anything that's keeping you from living your best life, the therapy team from BetterHelp is there to help you. They've helped me out, just kind of put things into perspective. It's always useful to have someone to talk to, and the professionals at BetterHelp are perfect for that. They make it easier than you could possibly imagine to fill out their questionnaire, get matched with the right therapist, and again, find a new one if it's not a great fit. So check them out now at the link in the description below, betterhelp.com slash VinWiki. More than 4 million people have done it and love the results, and I know that you will too. So without any further ado, please enjoy Tyler Hoover of Hoovy's Garage Top Car Stories here on VinWiki. Kimmy, are those butt implants? My car history and my history in general is just terrible. I am the exact opposite of Ed here. I am the most unshrewd negotiator, the worst car buyer you've ever met. And my YouTube channel may look pretty successful on the surface where I get so many views and, and obviously that brings money, but I lose my ass on these cars. It's just a stream of fails. And I've discovered the bigger the fail, the more views that it gets. So it's it's a really horrible cycle. And, and my car history is just filled with it. And I can't remember the cars because there's been so many at this point. I buy a car about every month now, which is terrible. So. Oh, no, 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 it's playing an ad with my Ferrari catching fire. That's, we'll come to that later. All right, we'll start with the 1999 Porsche 911. The cheapest Porsche 911 with a manual transmission, a coupe in the United States at the time was $9,500. Sounds pretty good, except it had 243,000 miles on it. And I called the mechanic shop that had done a lot of the work to it over the years. It was a one owner car, actually. It was a dealer selling it. And he told me not to buy it because the engine was starting to sound worn out. And I, I bought it anyway. It lasted six months, which was really good. It was actually really a solid car. I drove it to Florida and back from Kansas uh, to Amelia Island. No problems. It used about a quart every thousand miles. It sounded a little, a little, little rattly, but you know, that's, I mean, all Porsches kind of sound broken at idle. It's, it, now the turbo that I have now sounds really broken at idle in that that Mesger engine, that's, that's just normal. But anyway, where I killed it was on the track. I went flat out trying to chase down a Golf R and completely blew the engine. And then I thought it would be a good idea to swap in an LS V8, because that's a cheaper engine, right? Well, it's not. It's $10,000 to rebuild the Porsche engine, $17,000 by the time I was done with this LS swap, putting it in on a car I paid $9,500 for and probably put three or $4,000 into to fix. And that lasted a year. I blew the motor again on the track, the LS engine that's not supposed to blow. So maybe, might be pilot error there that might be blowing things up. I'm, I'm not gonna admit to that quite yet, because, but it's probably pilot error. So yeah, that car I sold for $10,000. And if you're doing math, that's well over $30,000 invested. So that's my first YouTube car and I lost $20,000 on that one. The next one is a 1978 Lincoln Continental coupe and I bought it from a guy in Las Vegas who owned a body restoration shop kind of thing and he said the car had no rust, no problems at all. And I had a friend who lived in Vegas go look at it. It had rust where they like to do around the Lando top all the way around bubbling up and he didn't tell me about that. It's so obvious. But his approach to it was like, oh, I'll fix it for you and then keep the same price. So he fixed it 
It showed up. It actually caught fire within two hours of it arriving. Completely burned. It didn't com like burn the whole car down, but the engine bay was trashed. The ignition, the carburetor, all that stuff had to be completely redone. His solution was to send me uh, spark plug wires and the distributor to make it all right. But I got the car. Constantly broke. The paint repair he did started bubbling within a month again. It was a really bad repair. And I sold it for a $6,000 loss about eight months later. So not as bad as the Porsche. But then I wasn't really paying attention to who bought it. I listed it on eBay, I think. And the guy was going to fly out and drive it back to Michigan. He was flying from Las Vegas. And for some reason, I didn't make the connection. And he didn't make the connection until he showed up that it was the man who sold it to me who was flying out to buy it again. And he didn't know, or claimed he didn't know, and I didn't know until we were there and he was looking at the car and I think, I think I've, I've had this car before. And I was like, it's you. So it was a really awkward, quiet couple of hours until he left with the car and he said he was gonna take it to Michigan to give to his dad. Oh yeah, I lifted a Dodge Grand Caravan, all track, all wheel drive, spent probably two or three grand making that thing into an off-roader that it was never going to be, then sold it for two grand after paying $2,500 for it. So that's their $5,000 loss. Oh man. Yeah, the S600, that wasn't too bad. I bought that for $4,500 with a blown motor, 2007 S600. I found a motor for $4,500, spent probably another $4,500 swapping it in, and it's running. It really didn't need that much after that. Sold it to Varsh for 12,000. So how much is that? That's only a two or $3,000 loss, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Yeah, a $500 Lincoln Town Car that I spent $2,000 on, and then I gave it away, so that's $2,500 loss. Oh, yeah, how can you lose buying a $300 Jeep Cherokee? You, you can't, you really can't, but I did, because I bought it, it had 360,000 miles on it, blew its head gasket on a ski mountain, and then I lifted it, put tires on it and all that stuff, probably had four or $5,000 into it and sold it for $2,500. I, I was a car dealer before this, so you can see why the car dealership failed. This, these are just YouTube cars. Oh yeah, my Mercedes ML55 AMG. I had a 2000 Mercedes ML55 AMG. Beautiful car, it was, it was, it was a Merlot, or what they call it? It was, it's brown, it was brown. And I had it sold for basically what I paid for it. I was getting it detailed for the guy who was buying it, and it got stolen out of the detail shop and went on a couple of high-speed chases and was eventually ditched in a field. They actually used it as a bulldozer to knock over trees about that thick, and it made a surprisingly good bulldozer. Just plowed it in there, hit it there. It was missing for a few days because uh, it was buried in there pretty good. Pulled it out. It was actually in pretty good shape. I was really surprised. It was just kind of scratched up. And I sold it for, I think, $2,500 less just because it was so scratched up and now it had this history with it. And I actually sold it to a guy that's bought multiple cars from me. And you might be able to see it on NCIS New Orleans. Apparently it gets all of its windows shot out. It's like a bad guy's car. So uh, watch for that. Um, 2004 Cayenne Turbo, that was about a 5000 Where are we gonna end with this? because it just keeps going forever. I bought a 1983 Chrysler LeBaron, town and country Mark Cross edition. Beautiful teak wood panels, the nice leather interior. I always wanted one. They also have the talking car features, the same sound as the speak and spell, you know, where, where you push the button, your, your door is ajar, that, that kind of thing. And there was a guy that was selling 22 of them. He had 22, that was his entire collection of just these LeBarons. And I called him and I said, I wanted one with no rust. No rust, just send me one with no rust. And he said, okay, I've got three. Pick one of these three, this is the nicest one. I'll take it. I send him the money, he calls me once he gets the check and he says, hey, I looked at this car with another guy who was looking at one of my cars and I noticed it had a little bit of rust on the floor and a few little bubbles here and there. And I was like, well, I wanted a car with no rust. And he said, well, you already sent the check and I told you you should have come looked at these before you sent the money. So you should just take this car anyway. It's a good car. I was like, okay. So I should, the car shows up and the hole in the floor behind the driver's seat is about this big. I can, I can double fist it, which I, that, that looks bad. Uh, but it, it was a big hole. And there was a hole, of course, in the standard around the pedals. Every panel had rust on it. It was a total mess. It wasn't worth fixing. 
And it was so bad that I asked my mechanic to dig a hole on his property and I drove it into the hole and we buried it. We're about to dig it up actually. So, and we'll dig it up and see if it starts. So I tried to make my money back on the YouTube ad revenue, $2,500 plus $1,000 to ship it here, which is ridiculous. I shouldn't have done that and then buried it. So that's, that's zero, zero. And that's, boy, if we total that up, was that about $30,000, $40,000 just over the course of a year and a loss. And I almost did that with one car and that was a 2005 Bentley Continental GT, which is famous for totaling itself just through mechanical issues. And I bought this car because I still have a dealer connection. I'm able to go on to dealer wholesale. It's called OVE, a wholesale network, and buy the car. And it was a great price. And you could click and order a PSI on it. So I thought I was good. I actually talked to the seller and said I was going to PSI it. And he said, okay, we'll see what pops up in the PSI. But I think he knew that Bentleys were ineligible for post-sale inspections. And he was talking it up and, and knew that I was totally hanging myself. This, this car showed up and it was so bad. It looked so nice on the surface, but it was so far gone. Really almost nothing worked. It barely drove. And then I did a little bit of digging. I kind of glanced at the Carfax, but didn't look through it all. And there was a little note where it said, exported to Finland in 2008. And I've come to discover Finland is used as a front to send cars to Russia. And the car spent 10 years in Russia. When you Google the VIN, it pops up on all the Russian sites. I had Freddy, who speaks Russian, Tavares Hernandez, but he understands Russian. We, we don't know what Freddy's background is, but it's, he's, he's an interesting guy. And he told me it had been seized by the Russian government at one point and had at least two odometer rollbacks. The car has about 150,000 miles on it. He told me all this before he actually bought it because there's only one person dumber than me to actually buy that car, and that was Freddy Tavares on YouTube. So he bought that car, and uh, I sold it for $12,000. I paid $28,000 on it and spent probably three or four grand in a little exploratory surgery to just see if I could fix it, and no, no. Yeah, that was bad. And I guess the last car, and I, it's not really a loss, but it's related because Freddy bought it also, my 1995 Ferrari F355. And this was traded, I actually traded my Acura NSX for it that I was about $50,000 into and traded it plus $10,000 cash on a Ferrari worth about probably $40,000 because I'm a shrewd negotiator. Yeah. And uh, it didn't run. Didn't run, had a coolant issue where it busted its uh, heat exchanger hose and that got fixed and actually ran great. It ran great for months. I put over a thousand miles on it, then shipped it to California and it rather famously now burned to the ground, just exploded, burned this guy's camera guy that was driving it, another YouTuber uh, named Vehicle Versions, Parker. And that one I actually didn't lose money because of the insurance, but it's still a very big fail. So this, this my whole YouTube channel is built on documenting my failures and how big of a moron that I am. Okay, so we, it was a conversation and then you edit out the part where you're having the conversation a little bit, huh? Oh, this is, oh, this, the magic's out. Okay, the genie's out of the bottle. Yeah, Hoovy's Garage would not exist if I didn't get tweeted back by the most famous automotive presenter in the world, right? My origin, my background, I had a car dealership. I worked in the car business for 10 years. I was horrible at it. I, I gave it up and uh, started doing restaurants, but I got bored and I missed doing something with cars. It was actually really boring. I had a Prius, I had one old Mercedes diesel and my old Mercedes convertible, that was my first car. But I, I was mostly as normal as I'm ever going to get. And I really wanted to write. It was actually Doug DeMiro reading his articles on Jalopnik kind of inspired me to get going, but uh, I didn't know where to begin. I was just emailing people and saying, hey, I want to write for you guys, but you know, those idiots that email, they have no body of work, no experience, and you're just saying, hey, I want to write, and of course you're going to get shooed away. I had nothing. And then a friend of mine got a surprise invite for the Grand Tour, their premiere episode. They were out filming in the desert in California, and it was that $3 million opening scene where they had the burning van you know, hanging there 
spinning, all the cars coming through on the desert, and he asked me if I wanted to go. I was just like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm definitely, definitely going. And I flew out at this last minute, probably, it was less than 48 hours notice, got on a plane. So I had another friend in San Diego that was also going to join us, and I convinced them to cosplay this. We dressed up as the Interceptors. I don't know if you remember this from Top Gear where they had Jensen Interceptors because they kind of did a 70s porn stash vibe kind of thing with the cars and all that. And so we all had the fake mustaches and the ascots and I had the pink scarf to be like Clarkson. And I had no idea what to expect. We got on a bus from a school and we were taken out in the middle of nowhere in a desert. We were the first bus there. We get off the bus and there's Jeremy Clarkson just right there standing there to, to greet you to get off the bus. I, I imagine because they had been out of it for so long that they were really kind of nervous about this new project. It's hard to imagine those guys being nervous about something, but you could tell they were really happy to be back into it and, and you know, really wanting to engage with the fans again. And I had conversations really with, with all of them, all of them, all three of them separately. Of course, Jeremy Clarkson recognized us immediately and asked if we had Jensen interceptors and uh, we didn't. I actually got him to sign my, I had a Mercedes CLK 55 key, which I guess I could put, give you the VIN and then that pops up down there, right? Ties in. And I really wanted to get James May. I had both keys out there because at the time my CLK 55 was out with my friend in California. So I had both sets of keys and I really wanted Jeremy to sign one key and I really wanted James May to sign the other key. So I had a slow key and a fast key. You know, the captain's slow key. It, it didn't work out, actually Hammond, I asked him to pass it to him and he ended up signing it instead of passing it to him. But I had a great conversation with Jeremy Clarkson and we kept bumping into him and, and I feel like we kind of hit it off. I talked to Richard Hammond a little bit about that winching up the dam and the Defender, that crazy, crazy video, one of the last series that they did with Top Gear. And I really didn't get to talk to uh, James May that much, but you know, other than just a few little hellos and that kind of stuff. But at the end, Clarkson, we're in the desert. They're doing the big flyover. He's supposed to come out. I've drawn a kind of a, a phallic shape in the dust on his windshield, you know, just, just to mess with him. And he, everybody's having a good time. He's handing out cigarettes to everybody. I don't, I don't smoke, but you know, it's just an incredible experience. And I'm talking to him because we started up Drive Tribe and I had got on in early on the drive tribe thing and was, was curious, hey, what's gonna happen with this? And, you know, it turned out to be not quite what everybody thought it would, uh, but at the time it was a really exciting thing. We had no idea what was gonna happen. It, I thought it was gonna be my golden ticket because I couldn't get in anywhere else. And I said, you know, if I tweet you, will you tweet me back? You know, it, it would really help me because I'm trying to get going as a writer and, and everything else. And he kind of, said to someone a pleasantry, I, I didn't know. But at the end of it, they didn't allow phones, which was absolutely amazing because you can picture an experience before everyone had cell phones where everybody wanted selfies, where you could actually enjoy the moment. You could actually be a part of this whole experience and not have hundreds of people with their phones out just, just recording everything and stopping these guys to, uh, to get a selfie. You're actually able to just engage with them, have conversations, they signed autographs, but, but that's what really made it amazing. And once I got back to the car where my phones were, I immediately tweeted him. It was a picture of all of us dressed up like the Interceptors. We were posing with the CLK-55 in the back. And I said, thank you so much for an incredible party, something like that. It was a pleasure to meet you. And he immediately tweeted back, immediately. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. And all of a sudden people are messaging me saying, hey, what happened? Including one, I, it was with Jalopnik where I was trying to get into right there and I kind of didn't hear from him, but then I took this tweet, screenshotted it, emailed it to him, said, look at this. And he said, you wanna write about it? And that's how I got in. If I did not do that, if I didn't fly out on the plane and go meet Clarkson and ask him to do this and then the tweet and all that stuff, I, I wouldn't have any of this. It's nuts. And then it just keeps going because I really was enjoying Jalopnik, but it, it didn't work out. And it was all over in, in a couple of months. It kind of fizzled out and I was kind of bummed. I made about two videos, two, three videos. And uh, you know, I was like, okay, is this gonna keep going or is this gonna be one of those 15 minutes and, and, and it's up? And at the time, Doug DeMiro had just left Jalopnik and gone to Auto Trader. And I really got the idea that I needed to be his sidekick, 
I'd never met him before. Just a total cold email where I just sent it to him out of the blue. Took him a week to respond. He was very nice about it and said, you know, we've already hired some writers and we're, we're good. And I was just so insistent. I said, no, please, just, let, just don't pay me. Let me write some stuff for you. And I don't remember the specific exchange, but they really wanted someone that could make videos. And I said, yeah, I can make videos when I, I couldn't. I was using an iPhone for video recording and then had a second iPhone, my old one, for sound. And I would just set it next to the car and I was editing all of this in Windows Movie Maker, which hadn't been updated since 2011 or 12. So it was 720, it was a, a horrible to edit. And I had no idea what I was doing. I made a video about my 78 Lincoln and I parallel parked it into the back of my 911, bumped the Prius, just you know, it's how you drive it with a pinky and all that stuff. The shag carpeting just got really goofy and he liked it. And all of a sudden I've become the Doug DeMiro sidekick, the, the Robin to his Batman, which I've always wanted. And it's sort of where I've been ever since. And then it just gets even crazier because I'm not even a year into this and I get an email out of the blue, uh, someone asking if I wanted to do a reality show. And I thought, yeah, this, this can't be real. I've had a couple of emails with this and I just would Google the person and someone fresh out of film school, you know, it's kind of not, uh, yeah, it's obviously working out of their parents' basement, just, just throwing darts and seeing what sticks. But I Googled this guy, and his film credits were Deadliest Catch, Axemen, uh, Storage Wars, just a huge resume. And I got flown out to California, met with him, signed a holding deal. Everybody told me, including Doug, that you know we signed holding deals and nothing ever comes of it. I immediately get picked up. So now I'm going across the country buying cars for every episode and I have a camera crew with six people following me around as I buy cars all over the Midwest and, and now basically a year in I have a reality show. I have no idea when it's going to air. It's kind of complicated because it was uh, Verizon was putting it on for their Go90 streaming service and it went bye-bye. Then it was supposed to be on the Rated Red platform and they tube that website too. Uh, so it's out there. It'll, it'll see the light of day at some point somewhere we're trying to figure that out but but it's been a heck of a ride for two years and that's and now i'm now i'm here in Vinwicky. this is this is quite an achievement so yeah it's darker in here than i thought you're going to get shot people are going to hate you you are going to be the scum of the earth with these people turning off their cars Well, before YouTube and all of this, I'm a 10-year survivor of the car business. My first job in the car business was opening a CarMax in Wichita, Kansas, opening day, trying to explain to people how CarMax works, which wasn't a familiar concept back then. No haggle pricing, all the weird things they do. People just thought I was a jerk and not discounting the car at all. It was a bunch of Ed Bullions trying to shrewdly negotiate it. I'm like, the price is the price. We're meeting you smack dab in the middle at, at the price, and that, that's it. That's it. And uh, it didn't work out. I wasn't very good. I really was one of the last people to sell a car of all those people at the dealership. I think I sold three cars in the first month. It took me a long time to get my groove and figure it out. But I really didn't like the structure of CarMax at the time. You had to say the same thing over and over again. They did not want you to deviate from the script at all. There's a wrecked car in the showroom. They wanted to show people the wrecked car, tell them you would not sell them this wrecked car because CarMax is special. But people would say, well, would you sell me the wrecked car for a discount? Was, is, can I buy this car if it's cheap? And they, they didn't understand. They wanted to go out and look at the cars. You had to go through this whole song and dance. It was irritating. I quit maybe after four months. So the next job in the car business was at a Chevrolet Cadillac BMW store, which resulted in an amazing crazy experience with drunks and dysfunctional adults. Uh, there's another story 
from way back when, one of my first tellings here at BinWiki that uh, culminated into a, a crazy situation. But that was very different. The first person I ever walked up and talked to at that dealership, uh, they bought a truck full sticker. This was 2007 when the new Chevys had come out. Paid full sticker for it. I made $1,500 my first day. CarMax had made $200 a car. Thought that happened every day, so I went to Ultimate Electronics, bought a plasma screen TV, figuring it would happen the next day. Spent all that money. It didn't happen the next day, or the next day, or the next day. But I did learn a lot. I learned it's a great way if you're interested in cars and wanting to see what that world is like. You learn a lot in the car business. You may not want to stick in it your entire life, but uh, it's definitely a good starting point. But I wanted to go further, but I also wanted to finish college. So working full-time at a dealership and finishing college, it was hard to, to, to do that. So I quit and you know just worked odd jobs until I finished college the last couple of years. Graduated with a degree in political science, which is absolutely useless. It was the easiest way out, so why did I go to college? But, but anyway, I was determined at that point to open a car dealership. I thought this would be so easy. I see how much money these dealers are making. If it's mine, I can have all of it. So 2010, I open up Ad Astra Automotive, which means to the stars, that's the Kansas State motto, and I'm a big Mercedes fan, so I thought I'd be specializing in late model used Mercedes. Well, uh, I bought anything that I could make money on. The first day I went to the auction, I actually bought two Jeeps. The first one exploded on the way back from the auction. I sold it to the junkyard. The second one I made about $1,500, and that made up for the loss, so I broke even. But that, that's kind of a theme for the entire existence of my car dealership, which was like five short years. And uh, it was very, very hard to make money because these dealer auctions, if that's where you're going to source inventory, like a lot of dealers are struggling with right now, you're not gonna find cars. It takes years to develop these wholesale sources, these honey holes, as they would say in American Pickers, to get these cars. But if you're just going to an auction and lane bidding, you're gonna get cars that people don't want and the auction prices are gonna be as they are right now, just ridiculously high to where you don't make money. So you have the issue with sourcing inventory, which was always a problem. It was also a problem with me because I'm a hoarder and want to keep anything that was cool for myself. I'm like a drug dealer wanting to do too much of his own stuff. But then there's the other side of it, why you don't want to be in the car business. Because it's the only business where people think you are a jerk for making money. You can flip houses and you're not a jerk because you put money into the house, making it nicer. You can flip it more. You can sell groceries. You can sell burgers and, and make money. And you, you're not a jerk for making money off of selling food, anything else but cars. Everybody wants to be like Ed Bullion and make it an adversarial situation where you making money on them is you getting something over on them. You are screwing them over. So it's very frustrating in that aspect. So even though I'm not working for a dealership, I'm still sourcing used cars from dealerships. They're wanting to make money. And then you're dealing with a customer. So on the back end, you're having trouble making money because they're able to look everything up on a computer and see how much everything's supposed to be worth. And so they want to pay trade in. They think they should be buying it trade in and selling it retail, just like everybody. So it's an endless frustrating deal. And I wasn't making any money. I realized I was going to struggle forever to maybe crack into six figures. Maybe. There was never a year in the car business where I made six figures. Maybe someday, maybe in this crazy environment we are now, I probably could have if I had stuck it out. But in those five years, I never made it. So I was failing. I knew I wasn't doing that well and I actually moved locations to a more expensive location thinking that would help, shared it with another dealer and they went under. So then it was all me in this one space. It got worse. So I decided, well, if I'm gonna survive, I need to change my business model entirely. And I see what these buy here, pay here dealers are doing. It doesn't matter how much they pay for the car. It really doesn't matter what they sell them for. As long as they're decent cars that are gonna last the life of the loan, they will make a fortune. And it's just money coming in month after month after month. And you get enough of those cars sold and it's a numbers game to where enough people make their payments, you're making money. The problem is, Every time I had done a little short-term financing thing with somebody, I was the worst debt collector ever. I would say, okay, you don't have enough money for the sales tax. You have 30 days before you come get the title to pay the sales tax. They would never have the money. Any loan that I did with anybody, they never paid me and they would walk all over me. It's like it was written on my face. I am a sucker. Even though I'm a car dealer, I am a sucker. And there's one woman that stands out. She was a teacher at a high school and she just needed a car. And I took this van on trade for $1,000 and I sold it to her for $2,500, something like that. A reasonable profit for a good running and driving van. 
and she put a thousand dollars down. This was kind of an experiment for me. And she drove off with the car, has a special needs son, the whole sob story. She's a teacher, she has a good job, her credit's bad because this, this, and this. Well, the check she gave me bounced right off the bat. So I call her up, she says she messed something up to where she didn't realize she'd come with the money. It took about a month for me to get that thousand dollars. And then once I got that thousand dollars, then she was talking about how the van was broken down and didn't work anymore. But then I would see her, Wichita, Kansas is a small town. I'd see her driving around in the van. So then I know I'm just absolutely being played and that's what happened so many times. It was gonna be a very difficult business, but I figured I could get somebody to handle that and we'd do the, the payment boxes where the cars would shut off and the tracking so you know where the cars are. And I was actually wanting to do a rent to own concept, which is a little different because, you know, you don't have to do credit checks and all that stuff, but the repossession is a little different when it's a rental. You're not taking away somebody's property, it's a rental until they own it. The laws are a little different from what I understood. And my father has been in business for a very, very long time. He was in the oil business, hated that because he couldn't determine the price of oil. Got out of it around when I was born, so he's actually a geologist by trade. But then he got into uh, fast food restaurants and uh, bought a bunch of Taco Bells, and that was basically his livelihood. I go to him with my idea in this business model, and I wanted to show it to him before I took it to the bank to see if they would finance me on this venture. And he looked at it, flipped through everything, and just thought, you're going through all the trouble for this. You're gonna get shot. People are going to hate you. You are gonna be the scum of the earth with these people turning off their cars. You don't wanna do this, and not for this kind of money. So he turned around, he printed off a spreadsheet showing me what he was making with restaurants, specifically this new venture, Freddy's Frozen Custard and Steak Burgers, and said, I'm starting to get involved with this. You can get in with me and work in the stores, it's gonna be different. You're gonna be flipping burgers and traveling a lot, but this could be a good thing for you. And I actually took his advice. I walked away from the car business entirely and thought I was done. Maybe someday I would be able to finance my dreams with burgers instead of cars. I could actually own cars without having to flip them to make a living. That sounded pretty good, but what I didn't realize was it was literally flipping burgers for years. And I went to training and realized that I'm learning how to flip burgers and churn custard and also how to run a business. And it was definitely an adjustment. Went to the first opening, had a great guy in place who was kind of a mentor that came over from my dad's Taco Bells, who is still involved. The two of us and some other people, we just built a great crew of opening stores. It's up to 11 stores now, but right around the time that things started to get on autopilot and we had people in place, I thought, well, I still wanna do something with cars, so I thought, well, maybe I can write. I've always wanted to write. So on the side, when I'm down in, say, a hotel or apartment that we lease for a long time while stores being open, I can write articles on cars. And it took a little while to get my foot in the door. The Jeremy Clarkson meeting him, which is another VinWiki story, is, uh, is basically my big launching moment. Also getting on Doug DeMiro's coattails, writing that up resulted in me having a YouTube channel that took off. And now, of course, YouTube is my full-time job. So I'm still involved with the Freddy's, just a, s a small little bit that I have a piece of. You take one step in the store, that's, that's probably my step. So I still check in sometimes, like the Queen of England or something, you know, just, just wave at the people that, that know what they're doing. I'm, I'm so out of it at this point, but they're, they're all great. They're doing a fantastic job. And me getting out of the car business, basically hitting the reset button and exploring this new avenue, this, this whole history enabled me to be in this place right now where I have all the cars really that I've ever wanted and more and I'm just super lucky. So walking away from something when you know it's bad can be a good thing and it can come full circle like it is now and uh, well, I'm, I'm sitting in here telling stories. Isn't that cool? The meep meep horn, I go and push it, and it, it doesn't meep meep. And I was pretty sad, but then things got so, so much worse. Well, I obviously have a lot of experience buying cars and just about every seller is a liar. Sometimes it's by omission, but sometimes it's sort of on purpose. So I'll give you an example of omission. One of them is a 1983 Chrysler LeBaron that I purchased from a crazy man that owned 23 of them. And I called him up 
He had a crazy ad that was shared everywhere on Jalopnik all over the internet, uh, advertising his entire collection of only woody Chrysler Barons for sale. And I told him I wanted two things. I wanted one that talked because that, that speak and spell box that would tell you in a deep voice that your engine oil pressure is low or your door is ajar. I definitely wanted that. And I also wanted one with no rust. He said, I have the perfect car for you, 3,500 bucks. Send it my way. It had holes through the floor that I could double fist. Every single panel had rust. I think the guy was just legitimately crazy, didn't know his inventory, and just sold me a car not really knowing what he had. Maybe he bought it 10 years ago and it wasn't rusty and that's how I remembered it. I just think he was crazy. There was nothing I could do with the car so I ended up digging a hole and burying it. When you're buying a cheap car, you sort of have to expect something like that. When you're buying a blue chip collectible, a $130,000 in my case, 1970 Plymouth Superbird, uh, you expect a lot more. And unfortunately, it was one of the thickest wool ever pulled over my eyes. So to start out, this was on Bring a Trailer. It was on an auction. It was uh, seven day with the seller actually saying he had two Superbirds. So you kind of feel good about somebody who owns multiples of them. The other one was a restored 440 car from a very, very prestigious restorer, and this was a different car. So the 440 is the much more common one. Of course, the Superbird is a homologation special from an old NASCAR where you have the giant wing that they had to sell to the public to be legal in NASCAR. Of course, current NASCARs don't have to look anything like the current cars. It's just basically a shell and a roll cage. But back in 1970, they actually had to look and really be mostly like the real cars you sell to the public. So they built a little less than 2,000 of these, most of them 440 cars. The race cars were all Hemis, but 135 of the cars were actually Hemis that were sold to the public. And the one that I bought is one of them. Now, it has quite a crazy story to it. It was raced in period, T-boned, and then it was listed in the Superbird registry as a partial rebody, so a little bit of a ding there. Uh, but I guess that gave somebody creative license to resto mod it, which is something you would never ever do to a Superbird nowadays. I think there was a record price just recently of $990,000 for one that was only 6,000 original miles. So me getting one for 130,000 is a great deal, but it didn't have the original motor. Instead of it having the 426 Hemi, it had the 528, sort of a crate performance Hemi, a Tremec five speed. But I kind of liked that because that meant I could really drive and enjoy it and also have modern performance. But but one takeaway was the suspension had been modified. Instead of the torsion bars, it had a coil over suspension. But I knew this is going to be my cheapest way to get into one of these, probably my only chance to buy a Hemi Superbird. So I bid, even though the seller wasn't answering a lot of questions in the comment section. He was kind of keeping quiet on some things if some things worked. And I turned out to be the high bidder. And actually, I had no intention of buying a Superbird until about 24 hours before the auction was over. And I was talking to the wife, we were actually in the airport in Las Vegas leaving SEMA. And I asked her if it was okay, and she said, well, no, but then I talked some more. She finally said yes. My kid's actually napping on my chest as we wait for the plane, and I'm bidding, bidding, bidding. I get this for $130,000. I'm the winner of a Superbird, and I nearly missed the flight because I'm not paying attention. I'm so excited about owning a Superbird. So eventually the car gets shipped. Of course, I'm buying it sight unseen, no PPI, as most people do on Bring a Trailer. You kind of trust the seller to advertise things honestly. And this is where I don't think the seller was lying by omission in a sense where, oh, I can get away with one or two things, you know, or maybe you forget because you don't drive the car very much. This car was never right from the moment it was built almost 10 years ago. So it was sold at a Barrett-Jackson auction during that period, and I think whoever built it just sort of put it together to look pretty to sell at auction. It had all the right pieces, but it was never put together quite right. And actually it didn't originally look right either because the Superbirds are supposed to have a vinyl roof on them to sort of hide things. And they wanted to show that it was pretty so they made it an all metal roof. So this guy actually fixed that. He put the vinyl roof on it. He took off the hideous wheels because in that period Resto mods were kind of not so pretty with the chrome and extra bling and things. Nowadays, they'll be a lot more tasteful when they're building a resto mod to make it a lot more subtle. Say, for example, they'll take a stock 15-inch wheel, use that as a pattern to mill out, say, a 20-inch matching set, just totally custom to really look right. Subtle stuff, which this guy kind of tried to do. He put on some larger wheels that sort of looked like the period racing wheels. He actually fixed the suspension, which for some reason they set it up to look like sort of a dragster with a nose down. He jacked it all back up. But when he did that, he overextended the struts and they had no way to, well, do any kind of suspension. 
So when I won the auction, my first thought was I gotta go pick this thing up in person and drive it home because that would be awesome for a YouTube video. And uh, the seller seemed pretty reluctant. He said, probably not because it would use so much gas. You'd be stopping every 100 miles. And the suspension, he did disclose the one thing. When I jacked up the suspension, the coilovers need to be adjusted because it's, it's not really riding right. It's riding really harshly. If you adjust it, then it'll be just fine. So I thought, well, Okay, I'll ship it in. It shows up. I'm so excited. It is beautiful. The condition is astounding. It looks like it was restored yesterday. I hop in the car, so excited to own a Hemi Superbird. I go and honk the horn. It has the iconic meet me horn from the Roadrunner, which the car was based on. The Roadrunners had the same horn. They actually licensed from Warner Brothers for the Roadrunner, and the Superbird had it as well. The meet me horn. I go and push it, and it, it doesn't meet me. And I was pretty sad, but then things got so so much worse. I took it on the drive and just leaving the neighborhood, the slightest bump, the whole car, it, it had no suspension whatsoever. It's like he put concrete blocks for struts and I had nothing but the tires and it just bounced like crazy. Even worse, I get up on the highway and the thing starts to overheat. It's also not running right. I barely get back to my house and then it's just whistling like a teapot out the uh, radiator cap. So obviously a total disaster. I'm able to drive it up to the Wizards though after I put a new radiator cap on it and it's still running hot and we go through and we inspect this thing and it is an absolute mess. Basically the seller before the person that sold it to me, whoever put this together, it actually changed hands a few times, probably never used the car. It was sold at auction and then just sat because so many things weren't hooked up. The iconic horn didn't work because there was no wire going from the horn button to the horn itself. The vacuum pumps, which were controlling the headlights and a few other things, they'd put in two vacuum pumps for whatever reason, and they were so loud. It was noisier than the motor. You couldn't hear a 528 Hemi over the sound of these vacuum pumps that sounded like, well, a broken hairdryer in a vacuum just, just competing for the most annoying noise in the world. I mentioned the horn not being wired up, but the uh, speedometer wasn't wired up, the fuel gauge wasn't wired up, uh, there were a lot of things. What was wired up was a total disaster and it was leaking from numerous places. So sellers can get away with one or two of these things, but then when it's 10 of these things, usually I start reaching out to the seller and say, well, hey, can we work something out here or at least try to get a story? And I would ask certain things. I hadn't gotten a title yet. And I would ask, say, hey, I haven't got the title yet. And then one or two of these little issues, he would address the title issue and not the other issues. So then I would ask another set of questions, something small about the car, say how it works, and then ask about some more issues. He would only reply to that one. So then I got more pointed, would ask exactly about the issues. It just completely ghosted me. Did the total head in the sand thing. Wouldn't even respond like, oh, I didn't know. No excuse, no nothing, just no response to my text messages at all. And that's what I knew, well, I was on my own. There's no recourse, really, once you have the car in your hands. In these instances, when you pay $130,000 for a car, and obviously there's a lot of undisclosed issues, you would think, well, maybe bring a trailer can help or whoever sold the car. I mean, these people, they're, they're just the middleman. They're not really making any money except on the buyer's fee. They're hoping that the seller represents the car honestly, but you know that you're bidding like you're just dealing directly with the seller. Bring a trailer is just posting the photos and writing a listing based on what the seller says. They're not responsible for fraudulent misrepresentation, but to their credit, they didn't want to make money on a bad deal. $5,000 was their fee. They refunded it back to me, which was a big help in getting started to fix all of these issues. The leaks from the oil cooler and numerous other places, that was pretty straightforward. Wiring up things to get them working again, like the horn, once again, pretty simple. But then the suspension, you had to get different struts, and that was a little bit of a bear to figure that out because it's a one-off thing. You kind of had to figure out just based on measuring uh, a lot of other little things. And then the car was better about $3,000 later, but still not drivable because the engine didn't run right. It was way out of tune. And then it was also still overheating. So the next stop was the dyno tuner. That's sort of where my mechanic, the car wizard kind of ends because he thinks the car's overheating because of the tune or something else. But since the car is running so poorly, it needs a tune. I need to do that first before I can bring it back to him for the next round of, of repairs. So we go there to this great guy, Polk Performance, takes one look at the car, kind of shakes his head, but he's excited that it's a Hemi Superbird, but then notices that the pretty shroud they put around the radiator uh, was right up against the radiator where the cooling fans mount, which blocked about 70% of the radiator flow. They just mounted it flush 
onto the radiator because there wasn't very much room with the accessories, say the AC compressor, to you know give it a little bit of a box for the air to flow. So he thought maybe drilling holes in it would help, which actually it did, but really we needed to build a whole new box to fix it. But then we found the next layer of, well, subdiffuge, I imagine. Somebody did probably try to tune it once, not that long ago, because there was a cord on the floor that looked like, say, an old printer cord that you would plug in to plug into a laptop and be able to mess with the old fast box, which has a date code of about 2007. Something you could work with, but still pretty darn old. And it turns out it was the wrong plug. Unfortunately, it took us about two hours of rifling through all this mess of wiring to figure out that that's the wrong plug, but obviously someone had been there before, discovered this, discovered they couldn't tune it, and just stopped. But then they just left the cord on the floor, which actually kind of sent us on a two hour long scavenger hunt with this, you know, false clue on the ground. So I wasn't able to tune the car, and well, I thought I was screwed. I thought I was gonna have to rewire the whole thing, which I probably should do because, well, it's still kind of a mess under there, but thankfully, the people who make the ECU fast, they were able to send us some wiring diagrams and some plugs and the actual diagnostic, you know, plug port, the proper one. So when I go home from here, we're actually going to be able to throw it on the dyno now and then maybe, maybe, I'm, I'm kind of doubtful, maybe it will work. But this has been six months and thousands and thousands of dollars on a $130,000 car, nearly the most expensive car I have ever bought. And it really doesn't matter if it's a $1,000 hoopty or a six-figure car. When you're buying something from the internet, sight unseen, even from the most reputable places, uh, the spending doesn't stop with the purchase price. You're going to throw some money at it. Sometimes you get lucky, but a lot of times, well, you end up like me. I'm very fortunate because I have a YouTube channel, so when things are bad, it's good because I get more videos out of it. But if you're just buying yourself and buying your dream car, just brace yourself. What are my neighbors gonna say? What are they gonna tell my parents when they get home? Are the police gonna get called? My first job in the car business was actually at CarMax. And it was opening day for the Wichita, Kansas CarMax. And nobody understood the concept of no haggle pricing. And it was really strict. They had you do a whole monologue where you'd show the wrecked car in the showroom and say, we'd never sell you this car. And then go through this whole song and dance and people would lose interest and say, well, why is there a wrecked car in your showroom that you fixed? Or would you give me a better deal on this one because it's been wrecked? But you know, they just, they don't, they didn't understand. I didn't, it took me weeks before I sold a car at CarMax. Didn't last there very long, but it gave me enough experience to hop over to a Chevrolet Cadillac BMW dealership. And this was in 2007, and it was at the height of everything. GMAC, which was General Motors Bank, was still going strong before the bankruptcy and all this stuff. They were financing everybody. And actually, the first person I ever walked up to, talked to at the dealership, the first up I ever took as a salesman, I sold the truck. It was a 2007 Chevy Silverado, which at the time that was a new body style and everybody wanted it. You had the new 07 Tahoes, the new Escalades. It was a great year for them as well. And he paid full sticker for the truck. He traded in his truck, which they way underbid. They actually held back on the trade. I was learning all these terms, you know, so they, they held about two grand on this trade. Which, so they bid, the wholesaler bid a certain amount, and then we hid $2,000 from him to make more money. And I, I'm just along for the ride. I have no idea how all this works. I've just, I've just hooked this guy with, not, he didn't even test drive it. And that meant $10,000 in negative equity on his trade, because it was a pretty new Chevy pickup. Full sticker on the new Silverado, auto approved, like that. No problem, he was out the door. I made $1,500 my first day there at 19, 20 years old. So I thought this happened every day. So I went to Ultimate Electronics and bought a plasma screen TV, brought it home, put it up. I was like, okay, we'll go make $1,500 tomorrow. And that didn't happen. And I slowly started learning the car business from this other aspect. And the cast of characters with this dealership was, was nuts. They had two salesmen they were battling it out for the most sales of the month. And they hated each other with a passion. And every customer was theirs. We'd take a customer, they'd say they talked to him once five years ago and try and get half the commission if we sold the car. But one would stay over on the used side. 
He went to jail for a while because he was scamming elderly people with security systems, saying he would, that he would sell them to people, and then he would sell you the security system, and then you could turn in a government rebate to get all of your money back, and there was no government rebate. So he, he would just sell them security systems and disappear. He eventually went to jail for a little while for that, and then came out and started working at this dealership. And he was selling certified pre-owned Cadillacs to elderly people for more than what they cost new and just making a killing. And then the other guy on the other side had so many sales that he actually had an assistant. And she was a well-dressed, well-spoken, middle-aged gal. And this salesman's married and they're having an affair through all this. And this assistant is very open with me and telling me about all this. And about the same time that I come on, they hire another guy who transferred with his wife from the military. And he was wild totally wild and he drank every day on the job. He had a very tinted out Dodge Charger where he could go in the back and nobody could see what he was doing. And then he started carrying on with this assistant as well. And he was into gunplay, like to help him, he wanted to hold a gun to whoever he was with. And he actually got in trouble because his gun accidentally went off in his home one time and the police were called and, and all that. And these are the people that I'm befriending at 19, 20 years old. And this assistant is also carrying on with the general manager of the dealership. So it's a giant, it's, it's nuts. The owner of the dealership, he was an old man. He would show up for sales meetings on Saturday mornings most of the time, but a lot of times he was just checked out. He'd go to Arizona, fly his plane down. And I recall being in a meeting where we're talking about internet marketing and he said, well, isn't the internet just a fad? So that's, that's what we were, we were dealing with. We were, it was all radio and television still. They were doing those wild commercials. And actually that lead salesman, he had his own dedicated marketing for his own radio commercials and TV. That's how, that's how big he was. This guy, he was selling over 50 cars a month, which in, in Kansas, a little Wichita, Kansas, that's, that's really good. To me. Basically, he sold more cars than the rest of the sales team combined easily every month. Yeah. And the gal who did the financing was brilliant. She would sell the extended warranty on everything. I, she was so good at it. And if somebody refused, then she would force them to all take hands together and pray for the car to pray that nothing bad would happen because these people weren't buying the extended warranties and they bow their heads and all this stuff and these people are just doing this and she eventually got fired I think for that as well but yeah it was it was a crazy place it's crazy and so this this guy that started around the same time as me he decided to start sharing his beverage that he made at home with other people and he was able to actually function on this stuff, but everybody else that drank it couldn't hold themselves up. And there was a customer, I remember telling one guy he could not take a customer because he's having to hold himself up by the pillar of the building because he was so hammered. And it was just totally out of control. The, the sales manager actually was really a horrible person as well. He eventually got fired because he texted a picture of his junk to the uh, to the uh, receptionist, a young gal, which that was an early thing. In 2007, there weren't a lot of people texting photos. I mean, it's a common thing nowadays, but it was the first time of me ever hearing of someone doing that. But uh, before all of that happened, before everybody got fired, I thought it'd be a good idea to have a party at my parents' house with all of these people while they were out of town. I had moved out at this point, but I was pretty tame in high school and I really never had my big party moment. And this was the first time when I really had, had a big group of friends like this to invite over. And it was a total, a absolute disaster because my parents have a bar that's fully stocked. It was all gone. And at some point in the night, uh, we couldn't find the, the assistant, the one that was carrying on with all of the men. And I walked out to the patio to try and find her and there was one of the salesmen outside and he was looking at gay porn on the patio and quickly closed his phone and said, oh, you're not, you, I'm not gay. And I was like, okay, that's, that's fine, it's no big deal, it's whatever. And then he asked me if I was gay. He was starting to proposition me and was like, oh. And he was actually later fired because he was caught getting serviced in the detail bay by one of the, the car washers. So 
Uh, the assistant is in the backyard doing snow angels in the lawn in the middle of summer just because she thought the grass looked pretty. And then the one that started around the same time as me, the wild guy decided, okay, I'm gonna take her home. She's pretty rough. She got kind of combative, started yelling and screaming, and then started running down the street of this very nice neighborhood, this well-dressed, professional-looking woman, running down the street, screaming bloody murder in the middle of the night with a large black man chasing after her. And I had to chase them down the street, and seeing this scene, thinking, what are my neighbors going to say? What are they going to tell my parents when they get home? Are the police going to get called? And that's when I realized, you know, maybe I should go back and finish college because this is probably not the future that, that I, should, I should put myself through. I, I think I should go back and finish college. And I actually did finish college and then opened a car dealership and totally failed at it. But that's neither here nor there.